Yeah, I think when you're a kid, you grow up and you realize, you know, oh, I want to be Zeppelin, I want to be the Beatles, I want to be, you know, I want to have that kind of thing. But ever since I've been 18, I've been a professional musician. I haven't had to work a real job in my life. And as soon as I saw it, I realized, oh my God, this is the oldest Ouija board I've ever seen come out of the UK. One click on the web, you can have access to this music, that's great. But the fact that it means less because we are not sharing it with a shared community, that's a loss. There used to be this guy called The Unknown Critic. And at the end, after the credits of a movie on a rental, he would do a, like he would just tape on right onto the videotape, his review of that film. Welcome to Starfish and Coffee. And today's guest, I have Christopher Joseph, who's, can I call you an expert in this subject? I will uh, anyway. In the mongoose, <laughs> yes, in, in the who, mongoose. Who is an expert in one of my my favourite stories of all time, because it's a hundred percent true, and I don't want any comments otherwise. And we're we're going to talk about Jeff the talking mongoose, who it's not a very well known story, which I'm always surprised about. But um, so so briefly, Jeff lived in a farmhouse on the Isle of Man in the early 1930s, if I remember rightly. That's right. And I'll let you take over, if you like, for the uh, pricey of the story. It's probably a lot deeper than I can go. Well, there was a, a farming family called the Irvings who lived on a very remote farm in uh, probably the most rural and isolated part of the Isle of Man, Um and in, they'd been there for since 1918, but in 1931, uh, they claimed that a little animal, a weasel-type animal, had appeared uh, in the yard and then in the house, and very quickly it started to talk, and it would also sing hymns and songs and various chit-chat and gossip about the neighbours, um, and it quite quickly became a local sensation with lots of, bearing in mind there wasn't a lot to do, there was no TV or cinema was quite expensive. Yeah, so so 1930s Isle of Man, I can, I mean, for anyone who's never been to the Isle of Man, it's kind of left of Blackpool, Windermere kind of way, sandwiched somewhere in between that coast of England and Ireland, about equidistant, I think. It's a strange place now. Never mind 1930s. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? It's it's like folklore is alive. It's not something that happened a long time ago. The the fairies and the superstition and the folklore is alive within your day to day life. Oh, so yes. that's what you're dealing with now. So hmm. uh, yeah, nearly a hundred years ago, this would have been quite normal, or just a little anomaly, perhaps. And I think there's significant part to emphasize is that the the region where they lived called patrick the parish of patrick was perhaps the parish where the traditional manx beliefs had still got a foothold and by 1931 there weren't many people speaking the language but there were a few older people and the idea of a talking animal seemed to map quite easily onto a mixture of Celtic and Norse folk traditions. Um, so there seems to be two, uh, were sort of two schools of thought in the area amongst the locals. The first, that the whole thing was a big old hoax that the, uh, the mother and the daughter had uh, set up to try and persuade the father to move back. I should make clear that they weren't native Manx people. They were originally from Liverpool. So Jim Irving was a Liverpudlian who had had quite a successful piano and organ import business. Um, <laughs> but before, he was doing quite well. Um, most of what we know about Jeff comes from Jim Irving's very extensive and voluminous letters and diaries. And I did wonder if this was true but i i looked into um censuses for the period pre-war period and went to the parts of liverpool where they lived and they 
not now, but they would have been quite affluent areas. So apparently he was doing fairly comfortably importing these lovely pianos and organs from Canada. And then after World War I began, some kind of tariffs to deter exports uh, unless they were war relevant. So put the kibosh on the business. So he wasn't a, a native Manx person. His wife, Margaret, was on her mother's side. His business collapsed. He started to dabble in real estate. And then for some unknown reason, he thought, oh, I'll be a farmer. I'll go to the Isle of Man. You know, it can't be that difficult. And of course, it is difficult being a farmer. Um, for about 10 years, it seemed to go okay. And he was able to initially use get free labour from prisoners of war because <laughs> so in both wars, the Isle of Man was a vast internment prison camp. So we had German POWs working the fields and doing up the house. His eldest son didn't really like living on this cold, lonely farm. So he left to go to London. So he was no longer any use. Wages shot up. So by the time that the mongoose appeared, mongoose in quotes, they were very, very poor. Um, the figure he gave was they were, the income was £1,500 a year, which I've estimated, no, that's wrong, £1,500 now in today's terms. Right, right. Uh, I can't remember what it was in those terms, but they were desperately poor. So mm, the suggestion that this was all done for money is an obvious one, the hoax designed for money. But it is odd that we learn later that James Irving refused uh, offers of money for um, some rather dubious photographs of Jeff and a, a kind of Barnum-type US theatrical impresario offered a staggering sum of $50,000. Um, wow. For exclusive That'll be all right money. now. Yeah, indeed. Uh, half up front, cash. Uh, I've seen the telegram, so uh, it definitely happened. But um, Jim Irving turned it down because he he didn't like the idea of Jeff being turned into a freak show and and, and leaving him. He he seemed to have developed a weird father son relationship with this little animal. Um, <laughs> so i'm getting ahead of myself so there was one idea amongst the locals was it was the mother and margaret and the daughter of Ori were conspiring against poor old jim irving to try and spook him and scare him so they'd move back to liverpool and the other idea seemed to be that people did believe it and there were hundreds of people going up to the farm especially on a friday night saturday night after a few beers and it got so much that he Jim Irving had to place a, an advert in the local press saying no no visitors except by prior admission because people were turning up and damaging the farm and banging on the door at all hours. <laughs> One of the I did have a look at this earlier on and I answered it, but I'm going to ask ask Tell discuss it with you anyway. Is how did a mongoose get to the Isle of Man? But I believe. That's not uncommon. They were they either came on ships or they were brought over anyway, as as rodent control. Yes. The, um, so it's so, not un, it's not unlike it's not like finding one down the road from your house. Now they were common. I think bearing in mind it was still the days of the British Empire, so that there was a lot of trade and traffic um, between here and India or the Middle East. Jeff said he was um, from Delhi. I was born June the 7th, 1852. He doesn't really seem to resemble an Indian mongoose. He was very small. But uh, anyway, there was another farmer, a real farmer with real mongooses uh, about eight miles down the road. And 20 years before this, in 1912, he had actually imported a dozen mongooses to control the rabbit population because apparently there are no foxes on the Isle of Man. There's, there's a peculiar, I don't know what you call it, a micro fauna culture. There okay. are animals that you'd expect to see uh, aren't there. There are weasels, and initially Jeff described himself as an eerie weasel or a ghost. I am a ghost. 
in the form of a weasel. But then after this began to be local news in the local Manx press, someone wrote in and said, I think, you know, what you've got there is a mongoose. And Jeff seemed to like this idea and he explained <laughs> Initially, he was called Jack the Weasel, and then he decided he preferred the name Jeff uh, the Mongoose. So there's very much um, whether you accept that he did exist, which of course we all do, or whether you think it was a hoax or a collective delusion amongst the family and the wider area, villages and so on. He does seem to have developed his character in response to outward uh, suggestions and stimuli. So initially in 19, I think it was, was it early 1932, uh, the word had spread and a, a Manchester newspaper journalist was sent over uh, to investigate and, and Jim Irving invited him in and says, there's, there's nothing supernatural about this. It's all perfectly normal. You know, it's, it's quite natural. It's just a talking animal. But a few years later, by which time there'd been loads of visits of psychic investigators and spiritualists and mediums, uh, and lots of people writing to him suggesting that Jeff, this was an elemental or a nature spirit. He then seemed to change his opinion about Jeff, and, and Jeff would apparently exhibit, what shall we say, um, supernatural abilities, shape-shifting abilities. He, he, at least twice he was seen in the form of a cat, he was often invisible, <laughs> some would say always. There are photographs which people can find um, in my book or on the web, and you, you will have to, the, the listener will have to make up their own minds as to how convincing these photographs are. Yeah, they're a bit odd, aren't they? The one of him sitting on the fence. Mm. Uh, as much as I believe in Jeff, could be anything from a rat to a cat to... It's just it's such a poor photograph. They're not very good photographs. But then it was 1930. Yeah, so Harry Price, once he began to be interested in this case, uh, was very keen to get some kind of solid proof because he went up there and visited the farm a couple of days, hoping Jeff would turn up. And Jeff apparently didn't like Harry Price. I don't like Price. He's the man that puts the kibosh on the spirits because Price had, of course, exposed all these frauds and fakes so Jeff wasn't going to take to him. So he didn't appear and Price was disappointed. But thereafter, once he'd returned to London, he was pressing the family for proof and he, he sent quite an expensive Kodak camera up there for, for the daughter to use, which it did take her a while to master, um, which is why the very early photos are extremely poor and they never get that great. One thing that strikes me is that in each photograph, he's different, which could be um, referencing his shape-shifting abilities, or it also could be explained by possibly these were rabbit skins or fox stoles artfully arranged on a uh, which was um, one suggestion uh, by another investigator. It's it, it's a world away from the Cottingley fairies, though, which um, maybe when I was eight, I looked at and went, well, that's cool. But not long after, you kind of, hang on a minute, they look like, <laughs> they look, they actually look like exactly what they are, which is paper. <laughs> yeah. But the Jeff pictures are strange because you, you can you can roll with it. If you're in with the story, you can go, okay. Mm. I mean, most people probably wouldn't know a mongoose if they saw one. But it kind of looks like a weasel or a stoat or a ferret. Yeah. But is from Asia. I guess that's the difference. Same family, right? Must be. Yes, yes. It's, uh, they're all mustelids. Um, he said he was... Well, he and the Irvings gave a description of himself such that Harry Price was able to commission an artist's impression of Jeff, which I'm sure people will be able to find easily. Six inches long with a six-inch tail, a very bushy tail, which is not typical of mongooses. And the most outlandish thing is the very large front paws. So one of the rather dodgy pieces of evidence was... Uh, piece of clay 
that or plasticine sent up by price and you can find it easily you see little teeth marks two back paws very small and then a front paw or claw closed and open and it's much much bigger than the back paws and when harry price had this analyzed by uh one of his um expert zoologist chums a chap called f martin duncan who worked at the um at the zoo at the zoological society in london he said there's no known animal that has such a disparity between its front and back paws but the the big front paws were useful because Jeff, this little animal, could then hold a torch and steal objects. He used to steal things from neighbouring farms and bring them back. Uh, Using a torch? Yeah, he had a little torch. Well, I see. He, um, he had a pen which, with which he did a very rudimentary self-portrait, which isn't very impressive, but I think it's impressive that he could... He wrote the letter G, tried to spell his name. It's phonetic. It's just G. I think it's G-E-O-F-F. He or it could be J E F F, but because he was a phonetic mongoose, it's G E F. Apparently, he'd seen it in the newspaper, and he he liked the sound of it. He thought it was more distinguished than Jack. Jack's just a sort of <laughs> common garden name. I'm getting excited. You see, every time I talk about Jeff, even though I've been, uh, oh God, I started <laughs> researching this. I think ten years ago. What hooked me, I think, was the complexity of it. So, so I used to work at the, um, I'm, a, I'm a librarian, I used to work at Senate House Library, which has uh, Harry Price Magical Library and Archive. And which is where it's the, the footprints are now, yeah? Yeah, the footprints and the, the very dodgy hair samples, which, curiously enough, resemble very closely the... Uh, the farmer's sheepdog. Um, and when Price went up there, he surreptitiously <laughs> snipped a few hairs off this um, very compliant and calm sheepdog, and, and lo and behold, they're exactly the same. So whenever I talk about this, and of course I believe utterly in Jeff's existence, it must be acknowledged that the hair and the clay footprints uh, are very crude hoaxes and uh, quite canine <laughs> yes now whether the photographs are also crude hoaxes uh that's up to people to decide i'm a little bit more convinced but maybe i'm a gullible sort <laughs> nope i'm along with you i mean it's no it's not that different than if there was more evidence i think the story would be ruined it, it's uh, you know if if somebody caught nessie it, yeah, it, it would it would just be a, a whole lifetime of story ruined for thousands of people, and Absolutely. and I like the fact that there's it is mysterious. I mean, it's obviously insane, really. But on the other hand, if if you're into this kind of thing, it I think it's the best story out there. I mean, did did anyone at at some point they must have leveled the uh psychosis the mental sanity of of jim yes and i um i gave a talk once when um a psychiatrist turned up not not for me but for <laughs> out of interest we never know well maybe he was doing both and he pointed me in the direction of several attested cases that took place in Ireland in the 19th century, generally about fairies and changelings, uh, sometimes quite horrific. The, the Bridget Cleary case, which some people will have heard of, is quite horrendous. But th there's, there's more, I mean, there's there were a few in written up in the 19th century psychology, psychiatry journals of a, a delusion taking hold of a whole family which is one explanation. I wouldn't rule that out. I think where it gets complicated is the, the number of local people who were prepared to swear that they'd heard Jeff. And, and in I'm thinking two, two or th possibly three cases, seeing him. And this is where it becomes interesting because, as I say, I used to work at this 
library and, and when they told me oh yes we've got the harry price archive and Blawley rectory and the schneider brothers and i said ah but i want to know about the talking mongoose and I, I kind of vaguely remembered it from osborne book world of the unknown books when i was a boy and at the time i naively thought oh well, i'll just spend a few lunch times going through the, the documentation and i'll be able to establish whether it was a genuine or a hoax and the more i sort of delved in the more I couldn't really say whether it was one or the other. There are clear elements of fraud, but there are, I think it was 20 people, locals, who uh, signed a document saying, you know, we, we absolutely believe in Jeff. We've we've heard him. And uh, he, he seemed to have an intimate knowledge of quite tedious details of local people's goings on. Um, so... The, the neighbouring farmer's wife is knitting him a new jumper or the bus driver's wallpaper is bright blue. And it was very precise but rather dull, mundane details. And and when one looks at James Irving's diaries and letters, which go on for a period of years, which is one thing that is quite unusual for poltergeist cases if 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 one interprets it as a poltergeist case they they tend to last my understanding is uh weeks or months but this went on for about eight years um i mean that's a long time to keep a hoax up yeah for no as, money for no money and as nando fodor the um the, the other investigator who who underwent a far rigorous investigation than harry price so he he spent a week living with the Irving family, and he interviewed all the known witnesses, and and um, he went away convinced. Um, he he was a trained psychoanalyst, so he would have had the, the that underpinning if he wished. But he seemed fairly convinced, although again he was disappointed that Jeff didn't appear for him. But um, he. Lots of people heard him in certain circumstances in which it didn't appear to be any of the three members of the family. So, yeah, there's some talk about um, Jeff's voice being one of the daughters being a pretty good ventriloquist type voice thrower person. Yeah, her best friend, uh, a Mrs. Kathleen Green said Vori was a ventriloquist and she could throw her voice. And um, she talks about uh, an episode where they were walking out in the fields and Vori was able to simulate a herd of cats at the top of the field. But interestingly, Harry Price didn't, and Harry Price was sceptical because that was his job and... I think he was a bit annoyed that Jeff hadn't appeared for him. His, his pride was was rather hurt. So he, would, I think, was quite willing to declare it a hoax. But the ventriloquism explanation wasn't enough for Price because, bear in mind, Price was a member of the magic circle and was very adept at conjuring stage magic tricks. And how he explains it, as I understand it, is throwing the voice is just an illusion um, you, you misdirect the audience, so you, I can't do it. But, you, you know, you lower your voice, you make it very small and tiny, and then you point over to another uh, area of the stage and say, oh, what's what's that? What are you saying? You know, what, what are you doing up there? So he wasn't really convinced that that's what, what was going on. But we do have Vori's best friend, the daughter's best friend, saying she was uh, a ventriloquist. So... <laughs> All the way through the story, there are contradictions and added complexity, which is probably why I spent years and years <laughs> of my life. <laughs> but but the kids are the kids are quite young. It's quite a sophisticated entire family scam for mm. a little bit of local attention when when you didn't want the attention. It's well documented that nobody was. Yeah, you know, everyone was sent away whenever possible, and there wasn't anything in it for them. They were never going to save their farm with with Jeff. They could, and, and they could have. Yeah, they could have. They were offered, I think, a guinea for one of the negatives for one of the photographs at a national newspaper, 
and and Jim Irving said no because it was so difficult. To, it was, Jeff is so shy that it, it it was a great effort to persuade him to pose that these are real, you know, these gold dust, very valuable things, and I couldn't bear to part with one. It's, it's very frustrating. We don't have a recording of Jeff, and, and there were discussions about. So we should backtrack a bit and explain the farmhouse had no electricity. There was no eating, really. <laughs> it was a very dark, miserable place. The, right. The, um, so the concrete, uh, the stone walls had been panelled with uh, wooden matchboarding. Uh, it was done by a German POW um, during the war with the idea of a, a layer of insulation because it's on a hill. Well, it's called Dolby Mountain, so very exposed in winter. Um, apparently they could be snowed in for some months at a time in, in some winters. But the point about the wooden matchboarding is that it, there was a gap of four inches between the stone walls and the wooden board. So just, just enough room for a little animal to scuttle around the, the, um, the floors. Bryce thought it might be possible for someone on the top floor to yell into a little crack and as if the sound would go all the way around the room. But oddly, he doesn't seem to have tested this which is very <laughs> nice of him, because that would have been quite easy, I would have thought. There are reports of Jeff's voice and noises, uh, banging, very loud banging on the wood with his tiny little paw, stones being thrown at the windows, and the reports talk about this, these noises going round and round the house with a, a wireless-like rapidity was the description. This is from one of Price's investigators, a man called Captain Dennis, who... He, he sent up there on three occasions, and by all accounts, Dennis was not a gullible man. And he came away fairly convinced. He he never saw Jeff, but he odd things happened on each occasion. Uh, uh, he could hear Jeff's voice. He was in the house with the mother and the father. He could hear Jeff's voice. It tended to sort of appear as if it was behind your shoulder. So he was looking at the, the mum and dad, so he could see their mouths. And the daughter was outside about 100 feet away because she was feeding the chickens. So he was fairly convinced it wasn't some kind of ventriloquism there. It wouldn't have been tape recording then. Such technology didn't really exist then, and they were far too poor. Um, yeah. Wax cylinders would have been about, about the extent of it. What a great story. Was your entry into it that Osborne book? Yes. I because if so. I remember rightly, in, in that book, which I also had, the uh, is the illustration of Jeff. He's coming from a crack in the in the corner of a ceiling. Yes, that's it. I have is it, have I remembered it correctly? That's the one. Very sinister, <laughs> these big claws that are just sort of emerging from the first floor, and I that uh, stuck in my mind. They did um attempt when Nandor Fodor, the investigator, was there, they they tried to, there is a photograph in um, the Society for Psychical Research archives in Cambridge. So that's another good resource for anyone who wishes to examine all this stuff. They tried to recreate that when his big flabby pink or white claws, but it, some people, sometimes you see it on the web as if this really is Jeff's fingers. I mean, they're huge. But in fact, it's a simulation that they're recreating what had happened. So the whole thing is written through with ambiguity. I was surprised to learn when I started going into this that uh, a presence of a voice and a very garrulous, foul-mouthed and uh, loquacious voice is not so uncommon in poltergeist cases as I had thought. Um, I knew about Enfield. Yeah. Uh, the more I looked into it, it seems it's not actually uncommon. And they do seem to have a rather similar character, I suppose you could say. Very impudent and cheeky, possibly the way a teenager, a naughty teenager might behave. Irreverent, foul-mouthed, threatening to do all sorts of terrible things, but very rarely, I think the Bell Witch is the only one I can think of where actual harm 
did happen. I mean, Jeff threatened to kill all sorts of people and poultry and chickens and things. But as far as we know, he he the only things he killed were rabbits, which was very useful for the family. They were so poor they could yeah. either eat them or sell them down at the village. I do think there is some poltergeist element to this story, but you know, this it's it, unusual it, to have a visible poltergeist though, isn't it? It's which makes it not a poltergeist. It is unusual, but it's not completely unheard of. There, there are some reports, um, the Epworth Parsonage haunting in the 18th century, which was the the Wesley family. Um, I think the famous Wesley was the, the one of the sons at the time. Um, and they had a very noisy and annoying poltergeist or haunting which would sometimes manifest as a mole or a badger. There was another one in the 19th century in the northeast, Whittington Mill, and again there was a small animal. It's as if something is trying to take on tangible form uh, and maybe it's easier to take on the form of a little object. You also get witches familiars, and I'm sure people... True, have, true. You know, the... Uh, engravings the unpleasant matthew hopkins which find uh very often mice rats um there was uh one witch who had a, a polecat called bid i think because he did her bidding and she would feed it at her breast that's now that is thing. weird that's very weird that's um, even weirder than the talking mongoose yeah the whole thing is weird um Unfortunately, I think she was. I think she was hanged. Price did observe, make the observation that if this case had happened four hundred or four hundred years before, the whole family would have been hanged as witches. And I think that's probably, unfortunately, right because it, it really would have slotted in. People were scared of the family. They were scared of Jeff, not in terms of what harm he would do but i think that was in the back of people's minds because he had threatened to kill a uh, neighboring farmer's poultry they were scared of the daughter they so we think of jeff as the talking mongoose but on the island he was called the dolby spook the village is dolby uh, near nearby village uh -huh. um, and this was also a name given to the daughter vori um she wouldn't talk about this she was very reluctant to discuss this case, but she gave, to my knowledge, two interviews. Uh, I've only found one. It was published in Fate magazine in the early 70s. Um, Reproduced in your book? Yes. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Um, Good work. A chap called Walter McGraw, who was very persistent and must have basically stalked her, I guess, and really um, persuaded her to... She'd moved to England... Um, she said, I don't want anyone to know where I live. Um, and it's rather sad. She says, this this kind of ruined my life. I couldn't get married. She's an attractive woman, you know, intelligent, charismatic. But she said, I, I couldn't get married because how could I explain this? And it does seem odd that if the whole thing had been a hoax, I can see why she would have maintained that while the father was alive, but after he died in 1945, wouldn't it have been simple just to say, oh, well, you know, it was a bit of fun between me and mum, but it got out of hand. Yeah. And father, she kind of suggests, she kind of alludes to this. She said it was, it was something that should have been kept quiet, but father was so obsessed by it, he wouldn't let it go. But at no point does she say it was a hoax, and she's asked by this journalist, McGraw, uh, point blank, was it real? Was it a hoax? And she says, yes, it was real, and I wish it had never happened. So it's rather poignant. So so from... She must have died within my lifetime. She must have been alive in, what, the 80s? Yeah, died in 2006, I believe. Okay, damn. I'm late to the party, as usual. She Did moved you... to Cheltenham, or a village near Cheltenham. She was... Um, she was very good at mechanical things and engineering things. Um, initially on the island, she was working for an engineering firm making parts for Spitfires during the war. And then this firm called Doughty's Engineering relocated to Cheltenham. So that was her chance to escape. And she moved to 
England and lived there. There, I do know someone who ran a sort of paranormal research group in the area, and he has a distinct memory of one of the talks that they gave was about poltergeists. And he remembers this uh, very striking looking older lady with very piercing eyes, which seems to be a characteristic of Laurie the daughter and Margaret the mother. And, and she kind of made these hints that she knew more than she was letting on. And, and he, he thinks she was called Irving, Audrey or something. I, I, I'm, I've asked him to try and see if there's any membership lists or, or, or um, yeah. Like but this was a while back. The, the dates seem to match up and the area matches up. She would have, yeah, she would have been in her 70s, I guess, by then. But then the idea of her turning up to one of these events seems strange because she seems to have been very, very reluctant to talk about it. So we're not sure if it was her, but he, he, he does remember this very striking looking woman with dark eyebrows and a very piercing look and how she remarked upon this guy's talk uh, with some uh, sort of first-hand knowledge as if, ha-ha, yes, well, that's wrong, but you've got that right, but she wouldn't elaborate. It's very tantalising. Yeah. I'm, guess- I'm guessing that, that everyone else must be dead then. There must be no living witnesses, friends, or they must be very close to... Are you close to being dead, if not? I spoke to a few people whose parents, grandparents, uncles or aunts remembered the case, but no one actually living. While I was writing the book, I was terrified that um, someone would turn up for his diary, in, you know, my true yeah. explanation and say it was all a big hoax and, oh, my God. But I, I felt I've got to, you know, be sure. So I... I wrote to the solicitor who executed her will and asked you know, whether anything didn't get any reply or no diary. But that, that was a terrifying moment. Well, but no, no reply is better than yes, no. Yes. Yeah. I mean, t- two questions at this point. The letters that Jim wrote, where are they? So they're mostly in Senate House Library in London. Okay. Um, anyone can go and look at them. Um, you just you just need to make an uh, arrangement in advance. There's also quite a lot of material in the University of Cambridge because that has the Society for Psychical Research archives. But the majority of Jim's diaries and letters are with the Harry Price archive in London. Right. And so far as I know, in a short version, they sold the farm in the end uh, what have I written here? Somebody, Leslie Graham, is that right? Hmm. Uh, purchased the farm and then announced he had shot the mongoose. That yes. Ended. Well. <laughs> he trapped um, a large polecat-looking animal. There is a photograph because it was in the local Isle of Man press. It's certainly much too big for Jeff. They showed it to Vori and she said, oh, it doesn't really look like him unless he's grown. No. <laughs> but Jeff claimed he was born in the 1800s, so yes. he, so even by the time he was living in their house, he would have been, I don't know, the lifespan of a mongoose, but I'm guessing it's not, what's that, he would have been at, at least 60. I don't think they have that longevity. No. Then. Like, so then you I really do so. have to drift into the supernatural, don't you? <laughs> Yes, and you know some of the things he'd said were absolute rubbish. You know, he he said he lived in Delhi and he was maltreated by two Indians, and he um, escaped and came to the Isle of Man via Egypt, where he saw the Sphinx and the pyramids. And there were a few He's quite an educated little fellow, isn't he? He yes, but then so were the family, and and a lot of his interests seemed to dovetail with theirs. So. And so say Vori was very interested in mechanics and how things worked and cars. And Jeff, you know, liked to watch the steamroller when the workmen were doing tarmacking the road. And he used to go down to Ronald's Way Airport to watch the planes take off. So there's elements of purple <laughs> character. Um, he, he led uh, a full life, didn't he? He did. He did. He packed it in. He packed it in. He, he spoke different languages. 
And Jim Irving was very interested, and in an amateur way, he was uh, interested in different languages. And he used to meet some of the older people in the area who still were Manx speakers, and he'd try and learn phrases. Um, there's some Hebrew that Jeff he sang, and um, Jim Irving seemed to be uh, had kind of a fondness for Jewish people. I think some of his clients, when he had the piano and organ business in Liverpool, were from the Jewish community. And he um, he said he used to go to the, there's a lovely big synagogue in Toxteth, beautiful place still there. He went there and he heard the, he described Oriental singing. I think it's probably Sephardic Jewish liturgy. So you get all these elements of, of their minds. So the idea of a group psychosis, whereby this thing is formed from the minds of the three. What, what's it called? It's called a, a folly adieu, right? Where someone's psychosis gets picked up on by the other members present as real. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and there can be a folly a plusieur. So it can be more than two people, which I... I wasn't aware of till this um, psychiatrist chap um, talked to me. Hence these these old nineteenth century cases in Ireland when a whole whole family that goes crazy, or, um, and they've tried to see whether they were eating, I don't know, poison mushrooms, or, or, or there's been all sorts of odd explanations that that the poverty of the family meant they were only eating rabbits and. Apparently, there's some kind of vitamin deficiency that, but none of it really explains how the, yeah. the bus driver was able to complain that his sandwiches were stolen. <laughs> <laughs> These kind of things. Oh dear, brilliant. Jeff can't be the only thing on your study list. You must have been when you when the book was finished, which is called. Uh, I will put it in the notes of the cast, but it's called Jeff. Jeff, uh, strange tale of a strange tale. Movie. That's right. Special talking mongoose. That can't be the one singular strange thing that you're that you have researched or plan on writing about. No way. There must be. You must have another project. At the moment, I'm just about wrapping up a biography of a a very strange character who definitely did exist. A man called Doctor Eric Dingwall, who was. Um, like Harry Price, a psychic investigator, but a lot more sceptical than Harry Price. He was also um, a librarian at the, the British Museum when the Library and Museum were one, and he was a custodian of what was called the Private Case, which was all the obscene pornographic and banned literature. And he seems to have been somewhat obsessed with sex. He, he would talk to um, fellow members of the Society for Psychical Research and ask them about their sex lives. And uh, he he has a, a very voluminous archive, like Price, also in Senate House Library, and the most fantastical scrapbooks full of ladies' lingerie brochures, <laughs> um, 1960s clippings from the news of the world about naughty vicars and spanking, and very odd man. He was a conscientious objector during World War I. And in World War II, he was um, an intelligence agent doing some kind of... I'm still trying to get, get that kind of... get to the root of that. But what I've found out so far is it's kind of black propaganda uh, against the Nazis, especially playing on their occult interests. So... Well, there's uh, a whole minefield right there, isn't there? Yeah, the, the, the Rudolf Hess is, is, is one... What springs to mind, you know, the, the, the idea that Alistair Crowley uh, was brought in to interview Hess because Hess was occult obsessed and, and would kind of collapse in front of the beat. It's definitely the case that Crowley volunteered his services and Ian Fleming, who was quite high up in, I think he was naval intelligence, wanted Crowley. He knew Crowley, but whether it happened or not, we don't know. The official line is that the... The British thought, yes, this is probably a good idea. It would work, but we don't want to be associated with such a disreputable fellow as Crowley because he's the wickedest man in the world and he's yeah. not a gentleman. There's a film I'd like to see. <laughs> Fleming and Crowley, out and about. 
fishing oh, or something. On the town, yes. <laughs> Thanks for this. It's been great. Yeah. But I, I don't imagine there being another Jeff the Talking Mongoose expert anywhere, but I'm probably wrong. I always am on these things. People oh, I'm turn sure. Off. Some, yeah, I'm sure there's others. There is a film I should point out. No. Nothing to do with me, so I'm not promoting my own wares. Um, Go for it. It's probably going to be released this year, and it stars Simon Pegg, a mini driver, and it has Neil Gaiman as the voice of Jeff. And as I say, I've had nothing to do with this, so I'm as curious as anyone to to find out how they how they do this, whether they show Jeff or just is it a voice voices off. Should You'd be have to go all out, wouldn't you? You'd have to give some teasing. Yeah, that would be interesting. I've not heard of that. I thought Nandor. I was quite up with Gaiman's um, workload. Nandor, Fodor and the Talking Mongoose was the working title last year when it was being um, made, which I assume is going to be the title. Yeah, should be interesting. And um, it will bring Jeff a whole new audience. Which, which is I excellent. Think, I think he wants that. I, I always People used to ask me, weren't you scared? You know, weren't you worried that, you know... You, you've got a picture of him above your bedroom wall, and um, which I do, of course. Um, and I felt not really because he, he was quite um, boastful and arrogant and he was the self-described eighth wonder of the world. And I like to think I've helped in a little way to publicise his name, um, which this film is going to do even more. Well, so that's I, what we're all here for. Yes. Here for live. I'm quite tempted to get a Jeff tattoo. There's some out there. I know there are. I've got one, but I'm not the only one. Oh. I've seen... Um, we could be a club. <laughs> yeah, Jeff Tattoo Club. <laughs> I'm I'm aware of at least one other, but I think there's probably four. You know it's quite addictive when you have one tattoo, you want another one. and I'm trying not to get my whole body covered in tattoos because I like the... Um, of Jeff. Of Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> on my forehead. <laughs> Brilliant. Listen, thanks for your time. It's been great. Thank you. Who thought you could talk for an hour about a talking mongoose? Easily done.